Hello, uh, my name is Dr. Masood Kandakar, and I am a, an assistant professor of medicine and a fellow in the Division of Cardiovascular Disease at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. And today I'll be talking about uh, a paper that will be published in the Cardiovascular Symposium in the Mayo Clinic Proceedings in June 2010 entitled Pericardial Disease Diagnosis and Management. So next, I'd like to talk about uh, cardiac tamponade. So as most clinicians realize, this can be a life-threatening event. So diagnosis is of ut utmost importance. So before you can use imaging modalities to definitively diagnose cardiac tamponade, uh, the clinician has to be able to make the diagnosis based on their history, physical examination, and occasionally ECG findings. So these patients typically present with chest pain. However, they can also present atypically with abdominal pain, right upper quadrant pain, nausea. And the reason why they present with these features is because there is hepatic congestion. Now on physical examination, the patient will often be tachycardic and hypotensive. Other features of physical examination include an elevated JVP, pulses paradoxus, and occasionally a friction rub. On the ECG, electrical alternance can be seen, and this represents the swinging motion of the heart. However, while this is a very specific finding, it's not that sensitive. If cardiac tamponade is suspected, this is a, a life-threatening situation and an emergency echocardiogram should be performed and this would be diagnostic. On echocardiogram, often a large pericardial effusion is seen and there is collapse of the right atrium in late diastole. Cardiac catheterization is rarely used for the diagnosis of uh, cardiac tamponade unless it has occurred uh, during um, a cardiac interventional procedure. The treatment of uh, cardiac tamponade depends on the stability of the patient. If the patient is stable <coughs> hemodynamically, uh, the clinician can observe. But more often than not, a percutaneous catheter pericardiosynthesis needs to be performed. Uh, in addition, if the patient is uh, hypotensive, volume expansion should be given. And rarely percutaneous pericardiosynthesis uh, fails and then surgical exploration may be needed. One thing I should note is positive pressure uh, mechanical ventilation should be avoided in these patients. So the last thing I'd like to talk about is constrictive pericarditis and the diagnosis of constrictive pericarditis has been very challenging. It's been difficult to differentiate constrictive pericarditis from restrictive cardiomyopathy and tricuspid valve regurgitation. Now why is this so important? Well, constrictive pericarditis can be treated with pericardiectomy. Restrictive cardiomyopathy cannot. So the diagnosis of constrictive pericarditis uh, can be quite complex, but should start off with a high clinical suspicion based on the history, physical examination, uh, chest x-ray and occasionally ECG. So the history uh, can include chest pain, shortness of breath, uh, fatigue and palpitations. Now these patients often have a history of recent cardiac surgery, prior history of pericarditis, or prior history of radiation therapy or connective tissue disease. Now, what are the features on clinical examination? I think the one th feature I would look at most 
is I would evaluate the jugular venous pressure. The JVP is elevated with inspiration, and this is called the Kussmaul sign. In addition, there can be other features of mainly right heart failure, and these include peripheral edema, a pulsatile liver, and ascites. On chest x-ray, approximately 25% of patients have evidence of pericardial calcification. Now, in these patients, the first imaging tool I would use is echocardiogram, and there have been a lot of studies on what the echocardiographic criteria for constrictive pericarditis is. I won't go into the details. The details you can look at in the paper. Uh, but echocardiogram has been shown to be highly specific and highly sensitive for the diagnosis of constrictive pericarditis. Now, if the diagnosis of constrictive pericarditis is definite by echocardiogram, I think you need to consider one of two options. You need to know if these patients have transient constrictive pericarditis or chronic constrictive pericarditis. And it's very difficult to tell just based on the echocardiogram. So another imaging modality that can be used is cardiac MRI. And on cardiac MRI, if there is evidence of uh, delayed enhancement of gadolinium uptake and acute pericardial inflammation, you might consider observing these patients and treating them medically for transient uh, constrictive pericarditis. Medical options, again, would include NSAIDs, colchicine, and occasionally corticosteroids. And these patients can improve just based on medication, and then they wouldn't have to get a fairly extensive uh, surgical procedure. Now, patients who have chronic constrictive pericarditis, the only real uh, treatment option is a surgical pericardiectomy. Now, this is associated with a high operative uh, mortality of approximately 5%, and so the clinician should be uh, very careful and very certain of the diagnosis of uh, of constrictive pericarditis before sending the patient for surgery. Now, if the diagnosis is still uncertain after echocardiogram, traditionally patients have been sent for cardiac catheterization. And the main features of constrictive pericarditis on cardiac catheterization include ventricular intradiabetes interdependence, which is the most specific sign, uh, and, in, and in addition there is the dip and plateau, or square root sign, of ventricular diastolic pressure. Interestingly, ventricular interdependence is also seen on echocardiogram, and echocardiogram is also very good at determining the human dynamics of constrictive pericarditis. Other imaging modalities that have been used to diagnose constrictive pericarditis include cardiac CT and cardiac MRI. Now one of the advantages of these imaging modalities is the pericardial thickness can be uh, more accurately measured. In addition, calcification of the pericardium is very well detected on cardiac CT and studies have shown that this does correlate to uh, operative outcomes. I think the diagnosis of the ver various pericardial syndromes is challenging not only to the general practitioner uh, but also to cardiologists. I think the major important take-home message is that pericardial syndromes are often underdiagnosed and misdiagnosed. I think in any patient who presents with chest pain, shortness of breath, or evidence of heart failure, and especially right heart failure, the various pericardial syndromes should certainly be in the, differ in the differential. If pericardial syndromes are 
more accurately diagnosed, we do have good treatments for all of the four syndromes that I've uh, discussed. And then I think it's very important for pericardial diseases to be included in, in the differential when general practitioners are seeing patients who have chest pain, shortness of breath, or any evidence of right heart failure.